Good morning, Year 12. We're here to talk about the EPQ structure. It's going to be quite a long lecture that I give you, and I'm going to try and cover a variety of different topics, okay? I'm first going to look at the importance of argumentation in the EPQ. I'm then going to tell you about what a literature review is, and this is something that will be very important at university. I'm going to tell you how you'd include any primary research that you use inside your uh, written report. Then I'm going to show you how the main body of the essay will be structured. And then I'm going to conclude by talking about the importance of cohesion, of gluing the essay together so that it establishes proper flow as an argument. Okay. Now firstly, I'm going to begin by talking about academic writing itself. And the first thing is that there is a kind of classic structure of how a dissertation should look. And that usually involves things like a literature review and methods, etc. You can use a traditional structure, but the good thing about AQA is they say that you are allowed to structure the report in any way you like. I've got a quote here from Professor Barnes, quite useful. He says, academics say they enjoy innovative structures, so you can be creative, but they also warm very positively to this classic model. And I'll be presenting you with elements of the classic model today. So what is your EPQ going to look like? These are going to be the different sections for most of you. As I said, this lecture is mainly for people who are doing the report, not so much people doing the artifact. I will do a different lecture for you. So you'll have a title page, you'll have a contents page. Contents page will have a list of acronyms if you use lots of different acronyms. You will have an abstract. That's about a 150 word, very tight overview of what you do in the essay. You will have an introduction in which you set up the argument, and I'll go into a lot more detail about the introduction in a minute. You will have a kind of review of background literature and a critique, an evaluation of the literature. Again, I'll be giving you more. And obviously, you'll end with some kind of summary conclusion and maybe recommendations for future study. All of your EPQ has to be carefully referenced, and we'll be doing another lesson on that. So after the essay, you will have your references and your bibliography, and you may have some appendices. That might be transcripts from interviews, graphs, survey results, anything that you think will add to the depth of the essay and show evidence of research. Okay. Now, as you know, the entire report will revolve around a research question. The research question, as we've done in two lessons, needs to be clear, focused, concise, complex, and above all things, class, it must be arguable. Placing the argument at the center of your research paper. So I put down an example here, which I won't go into. I just want to also remind you that your research question should be, if possible, broken down into sub-questions which help to answer the overall research question. Now, in any piece of academic writing, I have put down that readers have five important questions. Number one, what is the question? Explain why you're writing. Every piece of writing needs a purpose. One of the things that you'll establish in the introduction immediately is, why am I writing? Why are you reading? What will you get out of this piece of writing by the end of it? You will also explain how has the matter been studied? How have you approached it? Have you approached it through a literature review by reading things? Have you done some primary research? Exactly how have you engaged with your research question? And then you're going to address what information or data was obtained? And again, that will that will bleed into how you got it. This is by far the most important element of any piece of academic writing. What interpretations, comments, and evaluations are made? So think to yourself carefully about Bloom's taxonomy. I'll come back to that a bit later. When you are critiquing, evaluating, creating, synthesizing, those are considered higher level skills. 
If your essay is descriptive and you just give me lots of detail, you know you're writing a bad essay. And then finally, what actions are recommended? Okay, what do you recommend? What conclusion have you come to, in other words? Okay, so useful. Now, in terms of the argument, the classic argument in an EPQ will take this form. And I'm being very basic here now. There will be an introduction which establishes the context of the, of the debate and will introduce the arguments and the reasons why there is an argument, a discussion, or a conflict. Then, as my diagram shows here, you could have up to three claims. I wouldn't go into any more views than that in 5,000 words. It would be too complex. So you might have three different views. You're going to give some kind of details of these three different views, or two different views, if you wish. And the idea, then, is at the center of the EPQ is argument and counter-argument. All good EPQs are a discussion. They are a conflict of views in which the, the writer shows why there is a conflict and how the question will be answered by looking at this conflict. That usually entails either a literature review, which means looking at all of the background literature on your chosen subject, or and some form of primary research. At the heart of it needs to be evaluation, where you're looking critically at these different views and you're kind of balancing them. And this is what it should look like. So by balancing your arguments, I mean you need to show arguments on both sides. In order to score an A or an A star, I would be expecting, even if you are biased in your essay, that you are looking at the opposition point of view. Sometimes that can be quite controversial, can't it, camera? It may be something that you find very difficult. I've spoken to a boy recently who's doing an um, uh, EPQ on immigration and Trump's American. I can see that he's very anti-Trump. But for a decent piece of academic writing, you need to listen to your opponents. You can't ignore their arguments. So one of the things I'll be looking for is that you've got journal articles on both sides, that you've listened to both perspectives. What better thing to do if you want to beat your opponent than to listen to his arguments or her arguments and to deconstruct them and take them apart? One final thing with this slide, remember that you can use journals, books, government reports, you're allowed to use newspaper articles, you're allowed to use reputable publications like Time Magazine and Newsweek. The idea is to have a variety of data sources in order to establish a proper review of literature. The abstract. This is a very simple thing to write. You can either write it first or last. Whenever I teach uh, English literature, and I know there are a few English literature students here, and I am administering the coursework, I always make all of the literature students write their essay in no more than 200 words. I do that because by doing the, uh, uh, the abstract in a very short amount of time, what I'm doing is I'm forcing them to think about what is their argument. So the abstract is your argument with all of the flesh cut off it. It is the absolute bones of the argument. You all know from doing research now that the beauty of the abstract is someone should be able to read it very quickly and decide whether that paper is of value to them or not. Now we will return to the abstract in another lesson, so I won't say too much. This slide I want to talk about quite a lot quickly because I would like us to start writing introductions soon. So in a 5,000 word EPQ essay, I'm thinking of the introduction being a very important piece of writing, which is going to be about 500 to 800 words long. So it can be quite substantial. Don't think about it like a little introduction in a literature essay. This is like the introduction of a dissertation. What are the things that I want you to put into the introduction? I want you, first of all, to establish the necessary background and the context. Why are you studying it? Again, answering that question like, why does this matter to me? Why does it matter to the world? Identify the source of conflict or debate. 
Remember, I want the essay to be structured around clashes and conflicts. Establish why this conflict and argument has happened. I want you in the introduction, not in much detail, because you can pick this up in the conclusion, to start to think about what will the value of your research be? What does it hope to achieve? How is it going to add to knowledge? So think to yourself in those terms. You need a clear thesis. A thesis means, what are you going to argue? This report will look at this, A and B. It will evaluate them. It comes to the conclusion that, give a sense of your conclusion, okay? So that people can anticipate the argument and look forward. In the introduction, I want you also to clarify key terms. Are there specialist terms which I may not understand? If I'm writing about, say, literary utopias, how am I defining the term utopia? If I'm writing about the Middle East, which countries am I confining myself to? What is my research question? I can often put that into the introduction if I wish. And this is very important. In a longer piece of writing, you need lots and lots of signposting. What are you going to do in this essay? Which points of view will you look at? Which schools of thought are you going to address? All the way through telling the reader what to expect. Now, anyone who does debate, and I can see that some people do here, will know that good debates signpost initially, don't they? In this debate, I'm going to do this. Duh, duh, duh. Now I'm doing this. Duh, duh, duh. And then end. So you see, I did da da da. In longer pieces of writing, you have to help the reader's faulty memory, don't you? And so signposting allows the reader to orientate themselves around the, this long essay. And I'm going to say a lot more about cohesion in a moment. A literature review is a critical analysis of published sources or literature on a, on a particular topic. Cast from your minds the idea that it has any connection to English literature. It means the stuff that has been written and researched on, on something on your topic, okay? And in your literature review, it's not only summary, it's also classification. So say, for instance, you're writing about history. You might be talking about uh, post-colonial historians, or you might be talking about you know, left-wing political historians, or you might be talking about the conservative paradigm. So as you do your reading, you're, you're starting to think, how am I going to categorize it? And it's not about summary only. The important thing about a good literature review is that it is evaluative. It establishes the value of the work. Okay? Now, this is very important, so listen. In university, it depends on your subject. If you do psychology, for instance, they usually like you to have a separate literature review from your argument. But if you do like English literature like me, or philosophy, or history, or politics, you integrate your literature review into your subject. So you have this, and this is something that you can discuss with me and your supervisor. Will you have a separate, discrete literature review? Or will it be an integrative literature review? which means you've integrated it throughout your essay showing your reading. I tend to prefer the latter, the integrative idea of the literature review. But that's something that we can discuss at another time. The second aspect to literature reviews, okay? It gives the readers the information that they need. Remember that you've become an expert. So if you're writing about criminal gene theory, you are giving the reader all of that background information in the literature that they need to know. You are going to show the depth and breadth of your reading. This is the part of your essay that will have loads and loads of references. Good EPQs have 20, 25 reference, different uh, essays or articles or books that they refer to. Okay? You're going to establish connections between your research and what's been written before. Okay? And you are going to point out that you know the arguments associated with your discipline, that you're an expert in it. And also, you want to inspire and educate and excite people. This is the process, okay? You identify your research question. You've all done that. You review discipline styles. 
so different points of view. There's a genetic view for um, psychopath gene. There's a social view for a psychopath gene. There's an epigenetic view for a psychopath gene. You show that you're aware of these different disciplines. You do your reading. You manage your references. I hope, as I've told you before, that you're keeping careful records of your references and the date that you access them and the page numbers. You critically evaluate them using the crap idea that we looked at or using the knob TC or any of your own methods for critical evaluation. You synthesize, you work out how you're going to structure it and then you write your literature review. Okay? This is an excellent course by the University of Southampton. I'm not breaking copyright because I'm crediting it to them. I very much recommend that if you get the chance, do this EPQ course on FutureLearn. It won't take you too long and it gives you some very good tips. I'm going to show you a short video from that. Standing on the shoulders of giants. You find that engraved on the edge of the two pound coin, but you'll also find it at the heart of any good academic research project. It's a simple metaphor that sums up the core principles of academic research. Namely, the work we do is built upon that of the scholars that came before us to allow us to know more and to see further. Imagine these puzzle pieces represent our knowledge of a particular subject, say, evolution. Our understanding now is built upon the work of those that came before. Take Charles Darwin, for example. His work on the origin of the species, published in 1859, is widely regarded as the foundation of evolutionary biology. And because he conducted his work in an academic manner, making his sources and references transparent, explaining his methodologies and how he came to his conclusions, other scholars have been able to build upon that, expanding his theory and our understanding. And that isn't just limited to the one subject. There are thousands of giants that have developed ideas that we build upon. Take the story of Genesis in the Old Testament and the Bible, for example. That provides a very old picture. The world was created in six days. And other scholars have built upon that over time, developing theories like intelligent design and creationism. So try to keep this metaphor in mind at any point of an academic research project. Your project should not just be regurgitating the work of those that came before. We don't need someone else to just tell us what Darwin already had. You should be adding an original interpretation and your view. At the same time, we don't need it to be so original that it ends up up here, adrift of any of the research and scholarship that has come before. A good research project will look at the work of previous scholars, will build upon that while adding original views and interpretation so that you get the opportunity to make an original contribution to the subject that interests you. Okay, so I think it's quite a good video, and I like the idea of the jigsaw, so that you can see that your um, ideas will fit into what's come before. And you'll notice the jigsaw piece that is not fitted in means that you're too much of an outlier. So the idea is you do the reading, but you bring with it a fresh new perspective. That's the idea of a literature review. So it's quite challenging. We might have to come back to that and as you're writing your essays, I'll look at them and I'll tell you whether I think that you are not only summarizing the literature, but critically evaluating it as you go. Moving on then. So you're going to show a detailed knowledge of the literature. To do this, as I said, frequent referencing. Good paragraphs will have up to five references in. Not always, but just sometimes. So nothing gets said without reports. If you say, for instance, studies have shown that there's a lot of depression in UK school kids, I want those studies to follow. They must be referenced. No claims without reading. Quoting the authors is very desirable, but I would say try to keep the quotes quite short and use the English desk idea of weaving the quotes, if possible. If you are going to use a longer quote, then you lay it out properly and you really interrogate it. Don't just agree with it. That's the key thing. 
You need to reveal throughout the literature review that you're looking at the debates from all sides and that you see and you, sh you understand and you evaluate the causes of conflict and disagreement, okay? If possible, make references to the different schools of thought. So if you were writing a philosophy essay, you would write about deontology versus utilitarianism, perhaps virtues versus uh, virtue ethics. Show that you understand the different groupings and schools. Make sure that you've looked at specialist journals in your field if you want to get an A star. That's extremely important. Here is a good paragraph that I've taken from an EPQ. What is uh, I like about it? It identifies an authority in the field. Peggy Johnson defines collection development as a thoughtful process of developing a library collection in response to institutional priorities and community or user needs and interests. So the quote is very important to this particular writer. You will notice it shows where it comes from. It's from Johnson's writing in 2009 with a page reference there. Look further down. I have another reference from the University of Western Australia uh, Library 2015. Then later on, I have another reference of Ball. This is really important. We'll come back to referencing but she hasn't read Ball's book. She's read Carlson and Pope's book, and it cites Ball. So this is accurate, careful referencing. So in that one paragraph, we have four references. That is a well-researched paragraph. That's what a literature review looks like. It's embedded with reading and understanding of the field. If you are doing primary research, this is what you need to remember, okay? Your primary research must fit in with some kind of literature review. So if you're doing quantitative data like surveys, graphs, charts, etc., and you're using the objective methods, you say something about that. Remember the qualitative methods, more of the narrative research, is talking to people, interviewing people, and having quotations, etc., in. It's more of a subjective form of research, okay? What you need to do then is to show how your data supports your findings. The data should pertain to the research question, shouldn't it? And another thing to think about is how the data tallies with the, with the literature that you've been reading. So, don't forget, different qualitative uh, research methods, case study, record keeping, observations, ethnographic research, where you listen to people interviewing uh, using groups or focus groups. Make sure in your report you explain what was the research method you used? Why did you choose that research method? What were your findings? And how that kind of tallies with uh, the literature. Don't forget to critique your own research. Was the group very small? Was your sampling perhaps deficient in some ways, etc. Be very transparent about that. Now moving back to the structure of the essay, the basic structure of any piece of writing in any discipline is usually quite similar. The introduction, which usually gives you the general statement, general outline, the thesis, the different uh, main body of the essay that might have two or three different views in, this is the meat in the burger, isn't it? This is where the detail comes in. And then ending with the conclusion, which looks at the research question and says, hey, this is what I found. So that's the main, broadly speaking. But I'll go into a little bit more detail. In terms of the main body of the essay, in 5,000 words, you should break it into subheadings. So you might have chapters, and within the chapters, you would have subheadings, wouldn't you? So you could have major headings, heading one and heading two. Subheadings are so useful because they orientate the reader. So the subheading titles are really important, okay? They should show you how the report is broken up. They're a little bit like topic sentences. They kind of say to the reader, hey, I'm going to talk about this now, okay? It allows the reader then to read in chunks, doesn't it? The reader then can find their way around the essay. You'll notice that in a difficult academic essay, it's often the case that you read it many times. And so, say you're reading about quantum computing, 
there might be a certain element of com uh, quantum computing you didn't understand. So you look for that subheading, you go back and you find it, don't you? Okay. Subheadings should be concise or snappy. I often like um, questions. So why is it that graffiti is so hated? Why is it that graffiti is associated with lawlessness? Okay. So where did graffiti first come from? So these questions can really help the reader and orientate them, okay? And they can signal the stages of your argument. In future lessons, we will look at many different EPQs that are highly successful, and you will see common ingredients. And one of the most common ones is excellent subtitles that tell the reader exactly what you are doing in the different stages. Subheadings give coherence to a report. They glue it together so that we have structure. Structure is like architecture. If we don't have a good structure to a building, it falls down. If we don't have a good structure to an essay, the reader is lost. Moving on. In terms of the structure of your EPQ, it's going to look something like either the first column or the second column. You'll have your introduction. You may deal with it by having your arguments for and your arguments against in two separate bits with some kind of conclusion or maybe before that some synthesis at this stage. Or you may do it in sections like this where you go for, against, for, against, for, against. Okay? You have the option to decide which structure is the best one for you. And that's something that you will discuss with me during the planning stage when you're deciding on how your argument is going to be structured. Here's another very useful um, video that I want you to watch. Hello, my name is Diana, and together with Clive, I'm going to be guiding you through this EPQ mini week. I'm going to talk about the shape of a formal written report. So this shape has a head, a body, and a tail just like a report has an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. The dead fish shape. So the head represents the introduction. At the start of your introduction, you show how your topic connects to the wider world and why it's important. You then set out your specific area of focus. Notice the inverted triangular shape of the head, because as we've said, the introduction moves from the general to the specific. Finally, in your introduction, you preview the structure of your report by giving a very short description of the sections. This is like when you're planning a journey and you preview the landmarks that you'll pass along the way to help you find your way easily. So this is guiding your reader. Following the introduction comes the main body, which is divided into sections, like the body of a dead fish. Although your project should be very much alive, a skeleton isn't a good analogy. The bones are the structure on which you put the flesh of your report. In order to make it logical and readable, the body of your report must be divided into discrete sections which relate clearly both to each other and the title of your report. Typically, these sections also have headings which help both you and the reader navigate through what may be a large amount of material. Your sections may follow a predictable order, method followed by with the results, for example, in a scientific research report. For other kinds of report, however, it may be less obvious which order to put your sections in. One way is to build a narrative or story that connects them logically. Here, it's not so much that there's a predetermined order, but that that order needs to make sense to the reader. To finish your report, you need to demonstrate that you have achieved what you set out to do, as stated in your introduction. The conclusion is like the introduction in reverse. It goes from the specific focus of your project to showing its wider relevance, hence the triangular shape. This will leave your supervisor with a good sense of the value of your project. Remember, your conclusion is the last thing they will read. Before you write anything, use the dead fish shape as your plan by putting the names of your sections on its skeleton. This will ensure you have a logically staged, well-organized, and clearly structured report. Okay, once again, that's an excellent course from the University of Bath, and obviously it's their copyright. I say this in case they watch this. I would strongly recommend that you do this course if you get the chance. Once again, it's on Future Learn. Now, cohesion. This is a very important um, element of all writing. 
And one of the wonderful things about the EPQ is that it does whatever your discipline make you think about writing and how writing works. And this is particularly important to say scientists who don't do any essay writing anymore, but who if they get to high levels in their profession will write reports. Now cohesion is gluing stuff together. It's making sure that ideas follow each other. And I'm going to talk about three different things that enhance readability, looking at this diagram here. Cohesion, so you need to think about cohesion between paragraphs, between sentences, and between sections of your report. How they come together and are glued together. Signposting, which we've talked a little bit about, and I'm going to go into more detail about this. And the use of regular summarizing. Once again, I'm going to use the analogy of debating. Anybody who does a long talk, for instance, my son did a very long talk in the Politics Society recently, and it was too complex. And one of the things that he got wrong is that he gave a really intellectual talk for about 20 minutes. Now, anyone who's a good talker will do something like I'm doing now. They'll say, blah, 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 Professor Dutta said this. So what have I just told you? Let's just go through. Many summaries. Many summaries, many, many plenaries. are. You'll notice any good teacher does that. They'll stop after five or six minutes of really complex detail and they'll say, so have you understood that? Let's just go through that again. So in your writing, little mini conclusions can be very valuable at helping the reader follow you. I strongly recommend them. And it's something you will see in my top EPQs this year. I sat yesterday looking for these little mini conclusions, really looking at the cohesion, critiquing the essays and telling people what to do. So, one of the ways in which you establish coherence, one of the main ways, is to have excellent discourse markers and connectives. Now, you all know that. Things like sequencing firstly, secondly, etc. But also using ones that are connecting and linking phrases. And I'll go on to tell you more about that. Earlier, I mentioned, in the forthcoming chapters, I'm going to do the following. So they allow the reader to move backwards and forwards when you're reading. Reading isn't only moving forward. It's actually, the more complex your reading is, I'm sure that some of you are finding this from journal articles, you go back, don't you? Because you've forgotten stuff. And if your writer has told you this was discussed earlier and reminded you, you'll remember to go back, won't you? So that's very important. So all of this helps us with what we call concatenation which is from a Latin word meaning to chain together. So very good arguments, regardless of the discipline, are concatenated and linked. So it's something I want you to think of very, very carefully as you begin to um, plan the structure of your EPQ report. Those of you who do English language may or may not have covered anaphoric referencing. Anaphoric referencing is when you say what you're going to do in the future it can be very useful for cohesion. Here are a few. A more detailed account will be covered in my section concerning the Iraq war. This will be illustrated more carefully when. A detailed explanation of this process occurs later in this paper. Flynn's thesis is controversial and will be examined more thoroughly when. Later in this paper, I'll examine why so many uh, critics question Flynn's conclusions. Okay? So I'm looking forward into the report, telling you what's going to come. So you, the reader, now you know what to look out for, don't you? The opposite is cataphoric references. When we look back, when you've already done something. The concept of blah, blah, blah was discussed previously in this paper. Prior to this, we examined the argument that, blah, blah, blah. Early in this paper, I showed da, 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 whatever. As discussed previously, as, uh, as revealed earlier, the overwhelmingly uh, majority of responses suggested that. So again, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, gluing, chaining everything together. I'm mixing my metaphors. And the uh, dead fish I've got wrong in my slide. It should be the opposite way, shouldn't it? But the dead fish is an interesting idea, okay? So in your conclusion, what are you doing? You've written, you've got all the meat in your essay, haven't you, all the detail. Now in the conclusion, you go back to the research question. You reiterate what the research was about. You restate your findings very briefly. You do not introduce new ideas, but you can make recommendations and go broader. 
So imagine I've got the triangle the wrong way. You would go from your specific essay, wouldn't you, to the broad implications of your research, detailing things like where there might be further research, where there's still gaps in the knowledge, what do we still need to learn about, etc. All the way through, dear students, have Bloom's taxonomy on your table or in your mind. If most of your essay is just remembering and describing and telling me about Kashmir and how many people are there in the history, you know you're scoring low. When you start to apply, when you are analyzing, when you are evaluating and using the crap idea, for instance, when you're creating and saying a better version would be this, when you're up here, you know you're in the AA star region, don't you? Every essay will have some of this because we need to build the field. We need to tell people about the necessary information. We need to tell them what the parallel universe theory is. But we know, don't we, that when we start to say such a scientist's work can be critiqued for this reason, you know that you're reaching into the higher regions of the mark scheme. And trust me, in every subject for the rest of your life, when you're critically evaluating, you know you're doing the right thing. Okay? Don't worry, I'm coming to the end. References and bibliography are absolutely key. If you have nice, wealthy, kind, generous parents, I would strongly recommend that you get Paper Pile. It is an excellent referencing tool. It's about 30 US dollars a year. It is wonderful. I'll show you how to use it. There are some free ones, but as we all know, the free things on the internet are getting closed down and they're never as good, okay? Um, we will do further sessions on referencing, so I won't say too much about that. Appendices, a lot of people want to know what these are. Well, these are useful things at the end of the essay that you might have referred to. So let's imagine I've got uh, Sarah over here and she's done 30 different surveys across the world. I don't want to know about all of them in the essay, do I, Sarah? But I might say in the middle of the essay, my findings have shown the following, okay? I choose one or two facts and then I say, for further details of this research, refer to appendices. Then you might want to put all the numbers and graphs and stuff which are really boring otherwise, and you don't want them there. And a few last minute style points before I finish, okay? Avoid confusing abbreviations. If you're going to use abbreviations and acronyms, have a list of acronyms, etc. If you have a very technical complex EPQ, have a glossary. Put it into the table of contents so that we can quickly look at them really carefully. Think about using diagrams, yeah? So if you've got a really complex theory like we know from philosophy, argument maps can be very powerful. So you may want to use some kind of infographic. That can be very useful. No personal pronouns in science reports, okay? So if you're writing as a scientist or as a medical researcher or stuff, there's no I, okay? But if you're writing in history or English and stuff, I is fine. It depends on the discipline. I expect highly academic lexis and specialist terminology. You are writing this report as an expert. Assume that your reader is an expert. Show that you have expert knowledge in your literature review. We're looking for regular signposting, connected, beautiful structure. We're looking for detailed references, as I showed you. Make sure that your grammar and your punctuation is absolutely excellent. No one will correct that for you. If you want to work with a peer, you can. If you want to use a spell check in Grammarly, you can. Okay? But don't expect anyone to correct your grammar, and we will be critiquing it. For an A star, I would expect very, very few errors. Uh, British spelling, please. We're writing for AQA, and so change your spell check to British. Program is not spelt P-R-O-G-R-A-M. It is spelt double M-E. And there are many other variations like that. So change the default on the computer to British spelling. In the past, this is what the examiners from AQA have said they don't like. Narrow range of literature, not enough reading. They'll put you straight into the CD one. They want wide reading. Remember, it's half an A level. It should be, you know, like the equivalent of doing an AS level. Lack of critical analysis. 
So too much description, poorly structured, not enough signposting, not nice headings, etc. Lack of references, make sure you've got lots of references. Weak reflection and refinement of aims. That research question is your driving question. You will come back to it in the research. It is your base that you come back to all the time. I will have model EPQ um, exemplars for you in any discipline. The good thing about me having taught this for many years is that I have some from Singapore, Malaysia, from our school. So I, no matter what discipline you're doing, I'll be able to give you a very good model. You're not to plagiarize it, but you can use it for ideas. Quick little checklist. Does the introduction help the reader understand how your research fits into a wider area of study? Does the literature review demonstrate that you are familiar with a wide range of literature? Is there ample evidence of critical evaluation of sources? Is your method section clear and detailed enough to allow other researchers to copy it and understand it? Are your conclusions clear? Does the conclusion complete what you set out to do in the introduction? Whenever you finish any essay in any subject, read your introduction in the end and read your conclusion. The introduction should say, yeah, 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 I'm going to do this. And the conclusion would say, yeah, I've done this, so this is what I found. Okay? You should be able to read those together. Have you shown your reader why your research matters? Extremely important, okay? Final two slides. Argument checklist is this. Explication, description comes in the beginning. This is what you need to know, reader. Identify sources of conflict. Present each argument literature review style. Use chapters or subheadings. Ask questions, for example, as I showed you. Evaluate the literature. Present your own findings, if that's appropriate. Interrogate all data. Don't ever give me graphs, statistics, or studies without thinking that numbers are just as biased as words. How were they collected? Interrogate them. In your conclusion, you must choose some kind of side. You can say, you know, I don't want you just to say, oh, we can't really come to a conclusion. I want you to say, well, both A and B have strengths, A in this way, B in this way. Or A and B both have so many weaknesses that I'd like a, a further position C. But the conclusion concludes. Don't be a weak person who sits on the fence and has nothing to say. Remember, show why your research matters. And end, as all researchers do, by thinking about what would be useful in future studies. Signal where you'd like to study more. Would you like to do a, a further research in this area? Did you feel that your sample was too small, etc., etc.? And my final slide, this is very basically what to think about. So I've got an EPQ, classic uh, uh, question. Criminality, genetic or social? I basically say why there's a debate. You know, some people believe that we're born criminals, some people say we're made criminals. It's really interesting, this is why. I, I, I lay out the genetic argument, maybe 800 words. Uh, arguments for the social argument, about 800 words. What I want to show you here is the really interesting bit where I'm hitting the marks, you'll see. I'm putting the majority of the writing into the evaluation, argument, analysis, synthesis bit. So I'm not just giving information and description. Then I'll have another, the creation bit. I'll talk about the implications for the criminal justice system. If people are born criminals, how can we prosecute them? I'll look at that kind of thing. I'll show my creativity and my analytical intelligence there. And then I will conclude on one side or the other. And I will show in the bibliography that I'm extremely well read and extremely well researched. Thanks for listening. It was a very long lecture, I understand that. The value of it will be that it will be there on YouTube for you. You can go back and you can use it as a kind of checklist as we go into our planning session in the future. Thank you.